Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along today. My name is Jamie McKenzie. I'm the chair of the uh, SA chapter of the ACRS. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present, and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Uh, just a little bit of a housekeeping. Uh, this is our first face-to-face -face seminar in a long time. So for those who may not have been here before or who have probably forgotten, um, bathrooms, if you need them, is back out into the foyer and then sort of do a, a U-turn and cut back behind the lifts. Um, let's see if we can get this working. There we go. Um, we're also broadcasting this session to a number of online viewers. So thank you also to those people for tuning in. Um, this is the first time we've run face-to-face -face and online at the same time, so just please bear with us. It's a bit of technical stuff we have to work through. Um, each of our speakers today is going to present for around 20 minutes, um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions after each. If you're tuning in online, there's a Q&A button there that you can press, um, send in a question. Um, please send in questions anytime you like. It's not going to just um, disturb the presenters. Um, so send them in and we can then ask them live that question um, and that'll be recorded as well. So the session is being recorded. Um, so if you need to get a copy of that, it'll be eventually on the ACRS website. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, given we are face to face, um, a few COVID reminders, please make sure that you've checked in at the front here with the QR code or the sign-in sheet. Um, please try and keep your masks on and practice social distancing. Um, as you will have noticed, the presenters will be removing their masks to speak, um, and you're welcome to obviously do that as well when asking questions. It makes it a bit easier to project. Um, so the Australasian College of Road Safety, or the ACRS, is the region's peak membership body for road safety. The ACRS co-hosts the annual Australasian Road Safety Conference, which this year is a virtual event, um, kicking off on the 28th of September. But Registrations are still open, so if you haven't registered and you're interested, please get onto that quickly. Um, the college also publishes the newly rebadged Journal of Road Safety. Um, so check that out. Um, I would like to encourage you to consider becoming a member if you're not. Um, membership is relatively affordable and we offer both individual and corporate memberships. Okay, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ben Haythorpe. Ben is the Senior Manager of Community Educate Engagement at the RAA and oversees many of RAA's school and community education programs, including the RAA Drive School. Ben's team covers many areas of community education, including child restraints, a fitting, preschool, primary school and high school students, as well as several programs tailored to older drivers. Let me get Ben's presentation up and then you can take it away. I'm not using microphone. Can you everyone hear me? Okay. I have quite a loud voice um, from years of being a teacher. So um, <clears throat> just to start off too, I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet on the land, lands of the Ghana people and also pay respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, what I plan on talking about today is, is it's not a rambling. It is actually, sort of, there's a bit of structure there, but I guess I, I've been around in the road safety education space for quite a while. And so I guess over those years, I've, I've learned a lot from when I was working uh, with uh, DIPT or you know, Transport SA, it was known back then. Plus I've now had 13 years of experience at working in road safety education at the RAA. So all up, I'm, I'm pushing 20 years of involvement in this area. So I guess I've got some, um, some learnings along the way that I thought you might find interesting. Uh, a little bit about uh, the RAA. Uh, the organisation that I work for, oldest motoring club uh, in Australia. We kicked off in um, 1903. And this first photo you see there is um, one of our first events that we ever held, which was a little uh, motoring gymkhana that went uh, up to Belair National Park. And the, the guy with the moustache, well, they both got moustaches, but one of them is George LaHunt, who was the patron of uh, the RAA at the beginning. 
uh, and so that's that event sort of kicked off the RAA's involvement in in the community in in South Australia back in 1903. The second uh, little piece of information there is actually the first driver's license that was ever issued in Australia. And that was issued to one of our, our founding members of the RAA, uh, William Hargraves. And the interesting thing about that is that license was issued in 1906. So if you do the maths, you could be a member of the RAA before you had to have a driver's license in Australia. The third little bit of uh, information there is from our history is uh, the first roadmap of South Australia and the RAA commissioned that and that was the, the first map that was was ever used and uh, was around for about 10 years and was very uh, you know, very widely used by motorists uh, in, in South Australia and some of the RAA's early you know community involvement events was there was no signposts back in in those days and so for the first 50 years the RAA would go around putting up signposts and we would get requests from the first two, I think, were Anguston and Gladstone, and um, requesting for signposts so people knew how to get from Adelaide to Gladstone. So RA went around and put up signposts. A little bit about our history. And since then, we've grown to be, uh, <clears throat> I think we're pushing 800,000 members, which is basically almost one in two South Australians are, um, are members of the RA now. So a bit of my own history. Um, so. I grew up in, in Manham, which is a little uh, small town on the River Murray in South Australia. Um, and I grew up on a farm uh, in the 80s. Uh, interesting thing about Manham and, and related to road safety is Manham was the place that uh, the first car in Australia was made. So the Shearer car, I don't know if people have heard of the Shearer car, it was a steam, uh, steam car that David Shearer made. And so the town that I grew up in was born in probably was the first jurisdiction in Australia to have a road safety issue because we had the first car. So, <clears throat> yeah, Manham was an interesting place to sort of grow up in. I grew my farm was is actually at the back here. You can't quite see where where the, we had our cows and all that sort of stuff, but it was uh, an interesting place to grow up. And I thought I'd share a little bit of a random story with growing up in in a country town in the eighties, and hopefully. By the end of my presentation you'll realize why i've told you this story because it's not really related to road safety but like i say i went to manham high very small school uh in fact one of the smallest in in south australia uh, i think we had more uh, my the, my uh, children went to a, a high school in adelaide and they had more students in the year level than we had in our entire school so it was a very small uh, rural high school and in the 80s, if you, some of us can remember back to them, some of us can't remember back that far. But uh, in the 80s, there was, um, it was the time of, you know, big hair, big shoulder pads. We were all watching Dallas and Dynasty. Um, we were listening to Dire Straits and Duran Duran and all of that sort of stuff. And, but there was also um, this thing called the Cold War going on. And that's when, you know, we had, um, Margaret Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan, you know, having goes at, at, at the Russians. And there was this Russian leader at the time, Brezhnev. I don't know if people remember or picture him. He was a big sort of burly Russian dude, quite a bit scary. And we were all worried, you know, as teenagers growing up in the 80s, that there was this thing called, uh, you know, nuclear bomb would be blasted off or something like that. So that was sort of the, the period that we were going through. Anyway, to get back to Manham. So our teachers at Manham High, they were worried that we were going to be, you know, culturally deprived growing up in this backwater in South Australia. So they used to chuck us in the Hino bus every now and again, take us down to Adelaide. And um, they um, took us one day down to Port Adelaide. And we were looking at all the ships and all that that were coming in and, and having a look around. And then we were walking along the wharfs and this was totally random, but the sailors came out onto this ship and, in, and invited us all up. And the teacher said, yes, you know, you'd never do this nowadays, but back in the 80s, you'd sort of, you did it. So we ended up going up the gangplank and we were walking up the gangplank. And then we sort of, it dawned on us that this was a Russian ship, you know. <laughs> so I was like, oh, gee, what are we going to do here? Anyway, <clears throat> so we got into, onto the ship and they invited us into the kitchen uh, and into the mess hall where they all had their, their meals. And all of a sudden, these little bottles came out. And you know, we were 15, 16, we were hoping they were going to be vodka, mm -hmm. but they weren't. They were mineral water. And um, they gave us all this little bottle of mineral water, which was the first time I'd ever actually drunk mineral water. 
which again, back in the 80s, life was a bit simpler then. We didn't have exotic things like mineral water, but I still remember tasting it and it was really, really salty. Um, but we sort of worked out that it was impolite for us not to drink it. So, you know, the whole class is there sipping our mineral water. And it was, was a really nice sort of, you know, it was only 10 minutes of the day. We just drank the water and had this basic chat and let us go. But um, the, the thing since that story was, um, you know, that, that has left a little part, a little memory for me. And so now, you know, I actually have never been to Russia and I'm not sure if I've met a Russian since, but I know if I do, I would be thinking, hey, Russians are, are really quite nice people. You know, they are very hospitable. So maybe we were given a bit of a bum steer by Thatcher and Reagan and all that sort of stuff. So that experience of going onto a Russian ship, I can relay that story now, even, you know, 35, 40 years since it, since it happened. But that uh, is a part of, of who I am and that's a part of, of my culture and, and what I have um, have learnt over the years. That's an important part to me. So, like I said, that story will make sense hopefully a little bit later on. So, fast forward on to the late 80s. Uh, I became a teacher. This is me uh, in my best tracksuit pants at my, with my first class at a place in the far north of South Australia called uh, Indulkana. And I was a teacher up there teaching uh, these little Pitinjara kids uh, all about the world, uh, which you do when you were 19, uh, when, my, when I started teaching. But the, the story, uh, one of the things that I did learn at that time is the Pitinjara people had this whole history, in fact, 40,000, 50,000 years of history of oral story, storytelling, they call it the jukuba, which is the sort of rules for living, how, how, how you teach the next generation of people to be safe, what the rules are for, you know, for, for where you can go and how you treat people and all that sort of stuff, which is something that I think white Australians have discounted for a very long time, the importance of storytelling as a way of passing down messages. So I think that's a really important thing. And this is part of what we do today as road safety educators. We, we do share stories. And final little uh, slide of where we're up to now. Um, so earlier this year, we put on our first Street Smart High event in, in Darwin, which is the third jurisdiction that I've heard uh, help uh, facilitate this big event, big road safety event. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So, <clears throat> Let's talk about the elephant in the room. And for a lot of you out there, you're going to be saying, but does it work? Uh, I've had lots of people over the years say to me, you know, does road safety education really work? There's no proof. You know, over the years, I've gone to ACRS conferences for many, many years, and I've always felt like education was a bit of the poor cousin, you know, enforcement engineering are sort of the golden children, but education just sort of gets slotted in at the bottom. Because we all know, and there are people in this room that know this, uh, education is very hard to measure. And a lot of road safety educators, uh, researchers, politicians want to be able to measure things. So let's look at, you know, does it work and how does education work? So what I thought we would do is we would talk to teachers because one of the things that I've learned over the years is if you want to get good road safety education into schools, you've got to get the teachers on site. From my experience, a lot of teachers want to teach road safety, but they don't think they've got the skills to do it. It's a little bit sensitive or I could say the wrong thing. So this is where um, organisations like the RAA and DIT that go out and help teachers teach road safety, I think is really important. So let's have a listen to a teacher who works at a northern suburb school who's come along to Street Smart High, which is our road safety event. Oh, it's, it's catching flies at the moment. Uh, oh, we'll go and... So that they can have that experience too. Well, that didn't work. We'll try again. Yeah, I don't know where the volume is. Someone else might have to help me with that.
they'll say, oh, this is the best excursion I've ever been on. They, they, you look around at the end of the last speaker and you just see tears rolling down their faces. But they come out and they've just learned so much in that whole day experience that I know it's going to stay with them for a lifetime. Even though I've seen it so many times and although different speakers change, I know what's going to happen. There are still moments where I still catch a bit of it in my throat. I think, oh, that's, that was hard, but yeah. They learn a bit of empathy. I think that's a really important one. They, you know, if you ask them, oh, you know, you, they'll say, oh, you know, I'm a great driver. They don't actually think about, it could actually be another, it might be they've not done something wrong, but it can be from some of the speakers, some of the speakers that are there will tell their story and they will just drive along minding their own business and then something else has happened to them. So I think that's really good. They can put themselves in their own shoes. They can also see what some of the consequences and difficulties that people have as a result of a car accident. And, and just from a diverse range of people too. So people that have been in an accident, um, parents of people that have been in accidents, other family members, but also listening to the emergency services personnel as well to see their perspective. All the staff are really supportive of Street Smart. They sort of really see the value in it. And every year I always send an email out to sort of see who, who would like to come on the excursion. And I always have more people volunteer than we have spaces to take them. And then um, I the staff member this year, she, she missed out. She goes, remember, I want to go next year. Make sure I get to go next year. <laughs> uh, I just think they want to share the experience with the students and the students have come back and they've told them about it and they want to go and see for themselves. One of the things that they don't tell you when you're trying to be a teacher is that your students will die. And unfortunately, most of those happen on the road. So I remember thinking at one point, what can I do to make a difference? And so when the opportunity came about to be part of Street Smart, I really wanted to get involved and think, well, I'm going to try and bring as many students as I can to Street Smart so that they can have that experience too. Okay, so after being in education for 35 years, here, here are some of my little uh, learnings along the way. People ask me, you know, you do this event like Street Smart High, it is only one, it's a one-off event. What, how is that going to change the world? And I relate it to swimming and learning to swim because swimming safety is, is very similar to road safety. You don't have one lesson of swimming and, and think I'm a good swimmer. You have lots of lessons over lots of numbers of years to be, be a competent swimmer. Same with learning a skill like learning Japanese. You know, you can't just have one lesson, but you can have lots of lessons from lots of different people over a long period of time, and then you're going to be, a, a, you know, a better speaker of Japanese. So that's why uh, I think uh, it's important that we uh, realise that everything contributes, and it's very hard to do one thing or, and have one lesson and say that that's the, the main thing that's made a difference. And again, just to relate, you know, to the keys to drive experience, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on, you know, keys to drive is one hour of someone's in, in New South Wales, 125 hours of learning, but we constantly have to try and justify that one hour to, to show that that can make a difference. And I think it's almost impossible to do. The other thing that I've learned is it's really important to make things relevant. Um, so by being relevant, you have to, pitch your messaging appropriately to where that kid's development is at. So obviously what we teach preschoolers is very different to what we teach primary school kids, which is very different to what we teach high school kids. So it's got to be relevant and you've got to have relatability to, to the audience. And that, so if you do that, then the kids are more, more likely to, to listen in. The last um, little picture there is, is a backpack. And the story that I tell about we, I call it the backpack theory because I didn't invent it. I was lucky enough to see uh, Nils uh, Grigerson, who was uh, a Swedish road safety researcher a few years ago, speak about road safety education. And he 
told this great story and so I've used it ever since. So um, it's, not, it's not my idea, but a little bit like the Russian story that I told before, Grigerson talked about a backpack that we carry around our backs and a road safety backpack. And throughout our life, we get different stories or we get different messaging. We hear from the police, we see a road safety commercial, we decide, we put that information into our road safety backpack. And depending on who you are, you might decide to put the police message in the big part of the backpack or the TV commercial in the small part of the backpack, but it all contributes. And so over a year of adding information to our road safety backpack, we're going to be safer on the roads. And just to finish up our sort of uh, education bit, I really like this quote. Uh, and this is part of what we're trying to do is about making it relatable um, and making people feel a connection. So Keys to Drive, which I've already mentioned a little bit about before. Um, Keys to Drive is a national learner driver project that uh, has its head office uh, for the country at RAA in Mile End. We've had uh, over 850,000 participants in, in that in every state and territory. Um, the idea with this program is to help young people be safe on the road by providing them one free lesson as long as they're accompanied by their uh, supervising driver. So the idea is that the learner gets some education and, and tips and so does the parents because the parents are going to be the main teachers of young people uh, on the road. So Keys Drive has a team of four people that work uh, full time uh, at the RAR office in Mile End. We've had, looking at the middle photo there, um, we won the Prince Michael International Road Safety Award a few years ago. We've been evaluated, I think, at last count five times by five, uh, four different agencies. Uh, and uh, while you know it's been very difficult to prove that that one lesson has made a difference, there's been some really good um, information that's come out of some of those evaluations. And you know the fact that we are aligned with best practice, um, a lot of the work and the theory behind Keys to Drive is actually related to the work that Grigerson did and also by what Trevor Bailey has done as well. So we know that um, you know, Keys to Drive is, is on the right track. The last little initiative is this program called Plates Plus, which we also deliver uh, on behalf of the Tasmanian government. So what the Tasmanian government did when they upped their GLS requirements uh, late last year is they offered everyone a second free lesson so in Tasmania, if you're a beginning driver, you get one free keys to drive lesson paid for by the Commonwealth and one free lesson paid for by the Tasmanian government. Interesting thing about that is lesson delivery rate has skyrocketed in, in Tasmania. So now Tasmania, which has half a million people, delivers more free lessons than Western Australia, which has a population of five times the size. So I guess it's about making, again, making something relevant and making something attractive to the young people uh, in Australia because two lessons is definitely better than one. So what is Keys to Drive in As two minutes? Trainer, you're one of the safest drivers on the road. But the minute you get your P plates, your risk of crashing skyrockets to 20 to 30 times greater. Keys to Drive offers a free one hour lesson for you and your supervisor. It's a 50-50 mix of theory and practical coaching to help you become a safe solo driver. Keys to Drive is about you taking control. The lesson is designed to complement your learning journey and not to replace your normal driving lessons. It's less about the mechanics of driving and more about the thought processes and decisions you'll be making behind the wheel. You're encouraged to do lots of driving practice while still on your L's. And this lesson will show you the benefit of practicing with purpose. It's a good idea to practice on different roads, in different cars, with different passengers, and driving for different reasons. Having a varied learning experience helps you learn to read the road conditions and anticipate what could happen next. Keys to Drive will help you build resilience so you can manage everyday driving without stress and cope with unfamiliar scenarios. You'll be encouraged to think about your driving and learn to find and fix your mistakes while also noting how different situations make you feel. There's also heaps of helpful tips for your supervisor, which is why they need to come to the lesson with you. The Keys to Drive lesson is not about passing your piece test. It's about teaching you the skills that will help you return home safely at the end of every day thereafter. 
To register for your free lesson, go to keystodrive.com.au. There's hundreds of Keys to Drive accredited instructors across Australia. Keys to Drive is funded by the Australian Government and supported by all state-based motoring clubs. As an elf... Okay, on to my uh, third team, which is called the Community Education Team at the RAA. Uh, like I was saying at the beginning, one of our goals at the RAA is to have continual touch points, to use a marketing term, or continual interactions with, with South Australians. From basic, we've used the term from capsule to car fit or from cradle to grave or anything like that. So we have a range of programs across all different age levels. So uh, the safety centre is um, a specially designed um, uh, education facility where we teach uh, parents how to install child restraints uh, in their own car. So it's a little bit different to um, some of the other places which do it for you. Our, our plan is that we teach the, the, the parent how to do it because we all know that sometimes the restraint gets loose or they, they take it out to let other passengers in. Parents need to know how to do it, be taught how to do it. So we offer an education uh, service and we get about 15,000 people a year go go uh, make contact with our safety centre to get advice or or to learn how to uh, fit a child restraint. Uh, the Years Ahead program is a long running program that we've been doing at the RAA for over 10 years. It's very, very popular, uh, aimed at the older demographic, uh, predominantly probus clubs, gardening clubs, community road safety groups, all of those things. And we, pre-COVID times, we're doing about 125 presentations a year to them all across South Australia. Um, so that's very popular and very well received, so much so that we've now got a whole suite of programs that we go. So, for example, we could go to the Victor Harbour Probus Club, and did you know there are five Victor Harbour Probus Clubs? But we could go to them every year for four years and we could give them a different uh, presentation every year. And the last one is, is, is a new program that we're, we're still trialling this, this year. It's called a Senior Drivers Masterclass. It's a direct ripoff of, uh, uh, what's that show? Uh, where they have Masterclass, the cooking show? Master Chef. Master Chef, yeah. It's a direct ripoff of the Master Chef name where they have Masterclass. Um, so the idea is we're combining some of the things that we've learned from the Car Fit program, from the Years Ahead program, and from Keys to Drive by combining a theory and practical uh, road safety lesson and driving lesson for older people. And we've had three trial days to date, and so far, you know, pretty good feedback. So the idea is that they have one-on-one -on -one attention with uh, with a driving instructor to maintain their safety uh, safety in their own car. So school education, uh, we've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, Street Smart Preschool uh, is a new program that we've launched fully this year. We trialled that last year and um, we went to about a dozen uh, preschools. And this is again part of that continuum of road safety learning because we realised that there wasn't a lot of lot happening in that space. So we've commissioned a road safety book, which is called Yippee. Um, and so we've got a South Australian author, South Australian illustrator. And um, this is my Oprah moment of the presentation. We've got a book for you all to get today that you can take home and, and share with your family. So we'll give them out as you leave. So this is the giveaway that's a part of the, the Street Smart preschool program, because we know, you know, kids will go and, and learn something. And then if this goes home in their bag and when they get home, the parents will notice and hopefully they read it. And there's some subtle, subtly woven through road safety messages about crossing at a crossing and holding hands that are woven into this story. Um, Street Smart Primary is a, our primary school uh, program that we've been running for over 10 years and we'll go to about 280 primary schools uh, this year. That's a partnership program that we've partnered with uh, Think Road Safety and the Lifetime Support Authority to get to uh, that many schools across South Australia. So we go, you know, as far as, you know, Sejuna and down to Mount Gambier and everywhere in between with that program. And Street Smart High, which uh, again, we've talked a little bit about before and, um, but I've got a little clip that we made, which I think is really interesting and goes to what I was explaining before about creating memories. So we had our 10th anniversary of Street Smart High 
a couple of years ago and we thought it would be interesting to go and talk to kids that had come to the, this event in previous years and ask them what did they remember? Hey, what's in your backpack? What, what can you tell us about what you learnt? So this is the clip. And again, just so you, you uh, notice, there's a, a woman with a stethoscope around her neck. So she said to us when we, we were into, she's, she now works as a, um, I'm not sure if she's a, a training to be a nurse or a, or a doctor, but she's in the medical area. And she said, uh, attending Street Smart inspired her to do this sort of work. One of the things we do remember was how many critical care response team actually took to get a patient actually out of the car. I I think that one struck out the most to me because I, I remember they were, there was a trapped passenger in the car and I remember like when they were taking her out, she was like screaming and everything and it was super, super realistic. So I think that that was something that like, strikes out right away. The guest speakers were very moving as well, um, and they definitely shed some light onto like the truth behind and like the more gruesome parts and like parts of that you don't normally hear and stuff. So that was that was very interesting. I saw the um, dad speech about his son's death, um, and it was more of an impact just seeing how devastating it can be if you're not sensible on the roads. It's so hard when right? someone could just come around for like, someone else would be doing. I remember that as well in the wheelchair basketball, and that was a really fun and a great time doing that. And the stories are just super touching. People got really emotional, it was a really emotional day, but super memorable. That it was just really kind of eye opening, really sort of like, wow, this kind of thing can actually happen to me. You look around at the end of the last speaker and you just see tears rolling down their faces. But they come out and they've just learned so much in that whole day experience that I know it's going to stay with them for a lifetime. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm rushing a little bit for time. Um, so I might just skip through. Watch this now. It's played in a minute. Stand up for your rods. Yeah, you have to say stop and get out. You just don't be in that situation. Takes you know true leadership and, and courage to be able to say, you know, stop the vehicle, this is not right. I think this is a good thing to think about before it happens because when it's happening, you don't have time and space to consider your options. Say so something if they don't listen to that, say, Hey, I'd like to get out of the car. This is really important because um, your life is in their hands. Research has shown that young drivers' brains are still developing. It's the prefrontal cortex that's still developing. And that part of the brain governs um, impulse control, um, critical thinking, and things like that, um, which are all really important um, for, the, for driving. Some scientists are saying that our brains actually aren't fully developed till almost the age of mid-20s to 30s in some situations. So knowing that your brain is different as a teenager to an adult is really important. While their brains might not be fully developed, it's more the fact that they haven't been in this life long enough to realise the, how bad the consequences can be. So hopefully that won't replay again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's a part of Street Smart High. Like I said, um, what what Street Smart is, is not just a day of sad stories. We also take the, um, the, the philosophy that we're, we're on about giving kids knowledge and skills. So that's what the idea of those little tough talk clips that we play throughout the day to give kids more knowledge and some skills as to how to uh, react in different road safety situations. And interestingly enough, after we filmed that, I don't know how many of you follow football, but Josh Jenkins no longer plays for the Crows, so we can't use that clip anymore. So um, 
And now Ollie Wines apparently is going to win the brown, uh, not, yeah, up to win the brown low. So it would have been really good if we filmed them separately. But anyway, there's another lesson for you. Uh, so just quickly, because I realise I'm running out of time, uh, drive school. Um, <clears throat> We're South Australia's largest drive schools. We have a, a, a range of educational type programs that we do. So it's not just um, kids learning to, to get their ills. We have caravanning courses. We, we provide corporate work and we do senior refreshers as well. Uh, and we have this program that we call Licence to Work that we, we again trialled um, a couple of years ago. And then we got funding for the first, um, for three years of this program. And that's the last, this year is the last year of license to work. So license to work is about helping uh, young disadvantaged kids, uh, predominantly in the Western suburbs of Adelaide in getting their license. Because we know that um, that's a, a difficult thing for, for kids if they don't have a, a registered car or they don't live at home or they might even be homeless. Um, so we put together this program with an organization called Western Futures, which has been very successful. Um, part of the road safety benefit and you know some of your researchers will know this if people don't have access to a license then they do tend to drive unlicensed anyway so by providing that license we're helping them uh, uh, be a part of the community and also hopefully avoiding uh, the problems that are associated with unlicensed driving so i've just got one last clip that i will play for you now They are able and made aware of the barriers that we're facing disadvantaged students when it comes to obtaining the driver's license. Uh, some of those barriers included uh, not having access to a registered vehicle, not having access to a competent supervising driver or money for fuel. So the RA developed a learning driver program where we would deliver the full 75 hours with a qualified supervising driver in an RA maintained vehicle, and then the learner will obviously obtain the driver's license. This program is amazing to help them actually get their license to then be able to get jobs. It's improved some of their mental health, their confidence, um, their responsibility as well, actually making sure they're getting here on time. What I've seen that's particularly uh, satisfying is towards the end of the training year, now they can see that the goal is in sight with the positive reinforcement and let them know that, yeah, hey, you can be successful, you can achieve these big goals. Uh, I think it's a very powerful tool, yeah. I know a lot of new rules, that's good to know. So more responsible now, more independent, and it's just um, taught me to become a lot safer in life, not just on the roads, but in general, you know. Um, I've had a few moments where I'm just like, yes, I did something right. And it's that feels pretty good. I feel like I can, I'm getting somewhere in life and like, yeah, just, I think I pitched myself in a year and I've got my license and it's a good feeling. It helped me so much because um, otherwise I probably wouldn't have gotten my keys by now if I didn't go to the program. It was so much easier so I wouldn't have that class and have to live or something like that. It's not about our school, it's not about the RA, it's about those young people. And if we can get them their license, get them that independence, that's what we want. And that's the other thing. There you go. And the good news about that is our first three years are done and RA is committed to continue the program and we'll be rolling out license to work next year in, in the Western suburbs, predominantly again in Adelaide and with a focus on Aboriginal students. So um, that's that was really good news when that was announced. So, uh, oh, what is that? So yeah, that's the end of the presentation and I know I've gone a little bit over time, so I don't know if you want to have questions at the end, Jane, or... Uh, let's do some questions now. Um... Does anyone have any questions? No, that's easy. Um, interesting that you began with the history of the RAA. I don't know whether you know this or whether you want to know it, but in the 1930s, so perhaps, well, what I'm, I'm suggesting is that we go back that far. But in the 1930s, speed of speed offences were determined by two policemen, and it wasn't many back then. Um, uh, a straight road, a uh, stopwatch, and a red flag calling the driver. And uh, the Roping Associations in Australia in the belief that if you were a, a safe driver and you're a member of the uh, Roping Association, you could handle, handle speed. Yes. 
and RAA patrols warned passers by that there was a speed trap in operation. That's right. Yes. So, you know how they did it? Because they had one the, the badges. Yes. There was a badge on the front of people's cars, and if the guy didn't salute yes. you, they you knew that there was yeah, a copper down the road. So, there you go. Bit of history. Um, Hopefully, the old AI works better with the police these days. Yes, that's right. We're friends now. <laughs> I think we've got a question from online. We do have a, an online question from online attendee. The road safety education is very different to training. Unfortunately, both being put in the same basket. How would you describe the two different? Yeah, that's that's true. I, I see education as more holistic, and I think that's what I've tried to. Education is an ongoing process that can take many, many years. Training. You know, I can train, you know, a, a dog to get catch a ball or things like that. So I see training is more of a skill and a, quite a defined skill. This is only my, I'm just making this up, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Whereas education is a longer process. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to ask you about the Yeah, um, we've been in constant conversation with many, many organisations uh, since this pilot's been going in this trial. Um, to be honest, as soon as um, you know it gets down to the nitty gritty, it, uh, it becomes quite difficult for a lot of organisations. So it is quite capital intensive. So we need someone you know with a big checkbook, I guess, to come along and help us out to do that. You know, we we do this as a part of our community work, so it's not to make money. Uh, but, you know, those 75 hours uh, with a driving instructor, we have to pay, that, pay for that. So, yeah, it would be great to expand it and, and the model, you know, certainly would allow for that. Okay, unless there's any quick ones, we might move on. Right, thank, thank you, you so much, Ben. So uh, next presenter today will be Trevor Bailey. Uh, Dr. Bailey is a research fellow at CASA, having retired from the Department for Infrastructure and Transport, where he was a principal policy officer providing advice on a broad range of road safety matters. His work at CASA involves researching and reporting on a wide range of human factors relevant to road safety. Okay, over Thank to you. you. I'm Thanks, glad I got to take my mask off. It stops my nose from running and my glasses from fogging up. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is some work we did about three years ago for the former Motor Accident Commission. Essentially, it was a review of um, effective road safety uh, educational interventions for children and parents. And part of that was uh, a focus on effective messages. And uh, seeing this is the seminars on community education, I'm just going to be focusing on the uh, messaging part. Uh, I'll be first of all covering the importance of evidence-based effectiveness and then I'll look at some specific um, messages that are evidence-based um, in, in some detail uh, and then um, finishing off with some illustrations of past uh, campaigns and the lessons that we can uh, uh, learn from them because those, uh, those lessons form part of the, the evidence uh, base. And uh, as you can see, I'll also be having an, an historical perspective to my talk, uh, just like Ben, but I go back a bit further than the Cold War. Um, many messages directed at the public are very popular and well, well liked. Just because a message is well liked doesn't mean it's going to say, but doesn't mean it's going to be an effective message. Now we'd like effective messages to be popular, but it doesn't work the other way, other way around. And so it's good to see that uh, when um, uh, Fred Wegman from the Netherlands Institute of Road Safety became an Adelaide thinker in residence in 2012, in his report, he uh, recommended that only evidence-based education should occur in, in the state. And it's good to see that uh, this is echoed in the consultation draft of the next road safety strategy for the state up to 2031. It talks about best practice and appropriateness in education.
So what does evidence base mean in practical terms? Well, we drew on a number of uh, international uh, references and they're listed. Is, is this going to cause a bit of shuffling in the microphone? Perhaps I'll just hold these. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I was saying, um, we drew on a number of international um, resources uh, and writings uh, about uh, what evidence base for effective messaging should be. There were a large number of criteria, there was a large number of criteria, but I'm only going to talk about five here. First of all, we look for a demonstrated best practice through uh, messaging, pro program messaging, messaging program evaluations and uh, experimental studies. Uh, we looked for um, messaging, messaging that uh, mirrors effective school programs. And if you recall, effective uh, school programs is, is part of the consultation draft of the next strategy. We look for contextual appropriateness that is um, appropriate in terms of developmental stages of uh, children and with messages stay, sustained right from preschool up to year 12. We look for an emphasis on practical skills and um, real life situations and active and deep level learning because a number of research studies have shown that a focus on active and deep level learning or trying to promote that produces uh, better educational outcomes and promotion of personal resilience in the face of uh, peer pressure. Uh, again, a number of studies have shown that training children to be more resilient uh, improves their the, the safety behavior outcomes. And in fact, as you heard from Ben, the uh, Keys to Drive is, is, is now, that now has a uh, personal resilience component to it. Now, we looked around Oceana for um, um, resources that might embody those, um, those criteria, and we found three. Uh, Western Australia has a, a collection of policy documents and research summaries based on research studies of effective uh, road safety education. The ACT has a road safety education strategy, which is based on the safe system model. And um, New Zealand's road safety education strategy is based on developmental research. And uh, we studied the, me the messages, the key messages in those resources and made comparisons. And there were some, some commonalities across the three resources, but there are also quite some uh, notable um, divergences. So uh, it's uh, useful to focus on those because collectively, uh, the information will be very useful for formulating a new uh, road safety strategy for um, education. Uh, and if you want and uh, want a record of this, uh, my PowerPoint will be uh, available uh, afterwards to the uh, to the participants here today and online. Oops. Right. So. These are the um, messages that we found for uh, pedestrian, children as pedestrians. At the preschool level, the messages are primarily directed at parents in, in the first instance. And you can see that adults supervising children's safe walking behavior and safe, safe, um, safe routes is, is at the uh, foundation with uh, supervision by adults until roughly ages eight or nine, depending on the development and progress of the child and the traffic context that they're, they're in. Um, also interesting um, the, is that uh, there's a message there to parents from WA to uh, check your um, check the driveway before you reverse out of it because there have been uh, cases of child uh, young child pedestrians being uh, mown, mown down by um, in driveway crashes i think it's also interesting that for the uh, for early teens wa uh, points to responsibilities to yourself and others as pedestrians which is something that the other documents didn't uh, didn't pick up on um, now, of course, road crossing, how to cross the road is a central um, component of um, safe pedestrian behaviours. And really, the, the best way to teach that is the time-honoured way of explicit instruction. Some of you are old enough to remember Hector the Cat's 
road safety school in those pictures up the the, the top there but they um, guide the groups of children uh, in simulated road conditions uh, on teaching them or left look left look right and, and so forth and, and their children are actually practicing it time and time again and that is still probably the most effective way of getting to teaching children to cross the road now if um, explicit instruction went out of favor of, um, for a while in schools but if you've been following the debate on educational standards internationally Australia's falling behind and explicit instruction is coming back so that's a very important uh, a component of uh, teaching pedestrian skills uh, before I leave this slide I do want to focus on something unique in the New Zealand document because they give uh, a, a guidance towards messaging for uh, children's road safety behavior in general and it picks up on those last two criteria of um, uh, focusing on uh, active and deep learning methods and building resilience in children you can see that in the uh, preschool stage uh, it begins by encouraging children themselves to spot uh, hazards in in their on their daily works and our daily walks and uh, sharing the safe practices, communicating to others is an active form of learning. And they do that through songs, art, making plays and so forth. Up into in primary school, children discuss basic uh, road rules and are helped to develop appropriate uh, risk appraisal skills for various traffic scenarios they might uh, encounter. Moving on to the early teens, the, they're encouraged to explore their local road safety environment and communicate to others what they found about that. And for older uh, teens, that becomes much more in, uh, in depth through critically analyzing local road safety situations in terms of the safe system and then communicating their knowledge uh, in the wider community, uh, perhaps even to the local local council. So it was a way of getting them actively involved and it improves um, the, the learning outcomes. Uh, key cycling messages, uh, as you can imagine that uh, wearing helmets is going to be a prime focus right, uh, right through the ages. Um, interestingly, early teens, the message to parents there to help help them develop resilience to negative peer pressure to misbehave the act perhaps in recognition of the urban environment there and the fact that their strategy was based on the safe system advocates reduced exposure to high risk environments such as riding at night and uh, on busy roads and wa again comes in with respecting the rights of other road users uh, as cyclists and uh, those pictures up there were uh, from children in who were winners in a cycling safety poster competition so that again embodies active learning they're communicating safety messages that they've learned to others so it's a very enriching experience children as uh, passengers there again uh, restraint wearing is the the prime focus and it's interesting that for um, later teens wa has interpreted that message as the driver is the person responsible for ensuring all vehicle occupants are restrained um, also as a passenger in a car um, various messages helping children identify safe and unsafe behaviors such as distracting the driver uh, an interesting message from ACT again reflecting the safe system approach try and drive your children around in high safety rated uh, vehicles and there are also messages uh, there relevant to children who are passengers on, on public transport developmentally appropriate messages there and uh, those of you who are parents of young children will know that uh, <clears throat> the cartoon character, character series Bluey on ABC TV has a cult following. I know preschoolers who, in, who won't go out because they haven't seen Bluey yet. <laughs> They're so hooked on it. But it's good that the ABC has cap capitalised on that by um, uh, showing their two um, 
favourite cartoon characters firmly strapped into their, their booster seats. Now, if we get on to lessons from past campaigns. Now, some of you might recognise the uh, Dumb Ways to Die cartoon from Metropolitan uh, Trains. That was uh, went viral internationally on social media, extremely popular. Uh, but there's a lesson to be learned from that that I'll cover later. But um, for now, I'm going to go right back to World War II messages. Now, um, some of these were focused on boosting morale and patriotism. And there are at least three there in that top row that you might recognise today. They were so popular, they've uh, survived the decades to now. But remember what I said, popularity doesn't mean that they're effective message messages necessarily. Uh, we have road safety equivalents like um, appeals to keep the state's road toll down, uh, let South Australia beat other states, that kind of thing. Some messages uh, deliberately aroused fear, such as uh, um, that the enemy might be listening to your telephone conversations or over uh, overhearing chats uh, down the street and careless talk might reveal information to the to the enemy. And uh, we have similar uh, fear arousal uh, ads in road safety, a uh, fear of uh, crashing, uh, the consequences of death and injury, um, what happens if you lose your license, that kind of thing. There were also some messages directed at uh, parents, children and teens, and um, one, one lot, uh, related to reducing children's exposure to risk. Now, um, parents, London-based parents, were urged to send their children to live with rural families, um, which was a hard sell because the families who might never see their children for a long time, but then again, if they stayed in London, their house could be bombed. And we have messages to reduce exposure to risk in road safety. Um, for example, with our graduated licensing scheme, we encourage um, uh, young solo drivers to not drive at night or with peer age uh, passengers, reducing their exposure to, to that to greater risk. There was also critical health and safety advice, which is probably relevant to what we experience today with COVID, I think, um, particularly with uh, face mask wearing. Um, in case you're wondering, um, the, there, was, there was an ad there directed at young males aged 17 and over regarding um, transmission of, of uh, syphilis. And that was not so much a, as out of a concern for the morals of Randy soldiers. It was uh, more to do with conserving supplies of penicillin, which had only begun mass production in 1942 and it was urgently needed for uh, war wounds and not for uh, soldiers with, with syphilis. There was also a danger of um, children picking up unexploded munitions and detonators and poking them with sticks or pl even placing them on railway lines and watching when trains, watching them explode when trains run over them. Much like, well, I hope it doesn't happen so much these days, but I can remember hearing tales of children playing chicken on the road or um, at level crossings, try and get across before the car or train comes. So we have had critical health and safety advice in road safety and back, back then. Now, after the war in 1948, British Parliament commissioned a, a study of how effective the messaging had been during World War II and they came up with a very pessimistic finding. The problem was, was that um, when they devised the campaigns, they were treating the public as, as a whole, as one homogenous mass, and they had a one size fits all approach by and large. So consequently, while some individuals might have been affected, as individuals collectively, uh, they weren't. So we're now much wiser, and the second campaign I want to look at is the clunk click seatbelt campaign uh, in Britain in the 70s to 90s, which represented a complete turnaround, 180 degrees, in attitudes to wearing seatbelts. Before the 1970s, 
uh, restraints were available from about 1965, I think, in new cars. Uh, but the common attitude was, was that if you were skilled or safe driver, you and your passengers wouldn't need to wear a seatbelt. So to counter that, in 19, the 1970s, the clunk click ads, which began basically television and cinema ads. And it wasn't until 1983 that you saw wearing rates approach 39%. And uh, in the 90s, the campaign diversified with uh, a greater variation in ads targeting different audiences, including children and parents. And that was boosted in 91 by compulsory wearing being uh, voted in into Parliament. And so now in the start of this century, um, we are now seeing wearing rates in the 90% close to close to 100 now. So what were the keys to success uh, for that? Um, well, they, in, the in the 90s, they began segmented targeting of the clunk click uh, message uh, from everyone from business executives and estate owners in Rolls Royces and uh, Jags um, down to ordinary mums and dads driving battered up um, um, beat up uh, four prefects and it was good they had the had the variety of messages targeting different audiences because they all served to to uh, uh, reinforce each other um, they also had um, uh, uh, different messages playing on the theme of, of clunk click according to the road safety risk they had uh, a clunk click uh, every trip clunk click front and back uh even the shortest trip uh to to, what, to try and again reinforce the message that uh uh there's no situation where you don't need to wear a seatbelt they're required all the time and clunky click itself is rhythmic and it lends itself to catchy jingles uh and uh those short phrases were easy to translate into immigrant languages the campaign was integrated with um, enforcement and other education initiatives. There were posters, which we see here, billboards, radio, television ads, cinema ads, even mock road signs, as you can see, see there. Uh, as to the style of the ad, um, the traumatic events took, uh, were formed the bulk of them, typically um, bodies being held, held through windscreens. But there were also some humorous ads. Uh, there were also some emotional appeal ads. There was one in particular of a um, woman who was dis disfigured in a crash through not wearing a seatbelt. And she just spoke quietly and calmly to the camera about uh, the changes to her life, what she could do before, and what, what, what things she can't do now, etc. And it had such an emotional impact that it persuaded members of parliament to vote in the compulsory wearing bill in 1991 in what was one of the longest <laughs> debates in British parliamentary uh, history. It's amazing that uh, Australia was so late uh, bringing in compulsory wearing compared to Australia. One other um, approach they tried was using um, television celebrities to um, be shown uh, wearing seat belts and uh, explaining why they're wearing them, helping children um, uh, adjust their, their seat belt. Uh, unfortunately, one of those TV celebrities happened to be Sir Jimmy Savile, whom some of you know was later found to have abused around 600 uh, children. So consequently, 600 people, whenever they see a seat belt ad, uh, are, are traumatized ever since. So there's a message there. If you want to use uh, celebrities, be careful because sometimes they fall from grace. Um, the third campaign I'll look at is um, the speeding no one thinks big of you, better known as Little Pinky. Well, I think we'll see it first and then we'll, we'll talk about it.
Little, Little Pinky gained international awards for its uh, unique approach. And um, in a sample uh, of young male uh, drivers who reviewed the ad uh, indicated they, 94% uh, of them ag agreed with the, the message that speeding is socially unacceptable. The Road Traffic Authority in New South Wales claims that uh, it contributed to a 45% reduction uh, in speeding fatalities of young drivers, but it wasn't really a proper um, systematic evaluation. And it's a shame, a great shame they didn't do a more definitive um, assessment, but the, uh, often people get carried away by success and uh, uh, don't evaluate things uh, as well as they could. So what are the lessons that we can uh, learn from that? Uh, it was, they used, they based the ad on a, a recognised theory of behaviour change. They aimed it at young male drivers primarily, but also to peer, peer passengers uh, and in fact all drivers. If you noticed in the, the, the ad, the, one of the last scenes was the um, passengers in the back seat holding up the little finger and the driver looking in the rear, rear vision mirror, noticing that that uh, they, they were, were disapproving of his uh, speeding actions. There was an engaging approach for a speeding ad. It was in slow motion. So that Im immediately catches people at, at people's attention. There was uh, no spoken word or music, which made it useful to show to uh, audiences with limited uh, English speaking. Uh, the use of humour, little um, finger denoting diminished manhood. There were a few complaints about that, but the Advertising Standards Bureau quickly dismissed those. Um, and uh, importantly, they did uh, test the concept that uh, uh, speeding is socially unacceptable, both uh, before, during and after the campaign and to make sure the message got received properly. And then in the, during the campaign, the feedback they received enabled them to adjust the ad slightly. And the um, pre-testing the uh, concept before you begin the campaign was a very important step. I'm going to go back to the uh, Dumb Ways to Die ad uh, now, if you remember that, that, that picture there. And if you've seen it, you'll know what I'm, I'm talking about. But uh, the trouble with the humorous approach was that it was directed at mainstream Australian humor. Now, some social psychologists pointed out there are some uh, cultural groups within Australia who have a different sense of humor. And when they see that, they take things literally. And they, were, they warned that look, this message uh, could encourage people to commit suicide by train. I don't know if that actually happened, but that, but that was the warning from the psychologists. And for that reason, uh, the ad was banned from Russia's equivalent of YouTube, so it couldn't be shown in that country. So it is very important to, to pre-test the message. So fin just finishing off now, so what are the key points for um, effective messaging? Base it on recognised model of behaviour change, use educational best practice, particularly active and deep learning, building personal resilience in the child for, for when they're feeling stressed, for when they're feeling um, pressured by uh, by peers and of course speaking up have been resilient enough to speak up when peers do the wrong thing as in the we saw in uh, keys to drive make sure you have clear objectives for your message tailor the message content to the child parent is it developmentally appropriate pre-test it is it does the intended meaning match what's received Transmit the message in multiple ways, including in social media, media, gather data before, during and after to find out if the objectives were achieved. So that's it. Thank you. Questions for Trevor? We're getting a bit late, so I'm yeah, get I'll, I'll, I'll be hanging around. Yes, so. excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Trevor. Okay, well, thank you. Well, yes, that does conclude the, the presentation for today. Um,
I want to thank both our speakers again for coming along. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with them if you have any questions. So the email addresses are there. Um, that's it for our online viewers. So I might just close down the webinar. I can find the right buttons. Oops, that one. So yeah, thank you to our online viewers um, and we'll hopefully see you again next time.